Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of the Foothills Church in Gilroy, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We thank you for putting aside a little bit of time right now to listen to a message on the fruit of the Spirit it's from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Today, we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit of peace. And uh, before we get into that, though, let's have a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this great day. Lord, I thank you that you brought us peace, that you, that, that there was a problem between our, in our relationship between us and you, and, and you took it on yourself to solve that problem through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we give you honor and glory. Uh, last week, we celebrated your resurrection from the dead, and we want to celebrate that every day, that you rose from the dead, and that because of that, you brought us peace. And so, God, bless this message. Bless our ears to hear what your Spirit has to say to us, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the peace treaty. I want to, I want to go back in, in time. I, last week, we talked about Joshua chapter 2 and Rahab the prostitute and how she hung the scarlet cord out of her window. Um, just a little bit after that, uh, Joshua was out walking, and the nation of Israel was still on the east side of the Jordan. They hadn't crossed over into the Promised Land yet. But Joshua was out walking, and um, in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, it says this, As Joshua was walking, Joshua looked up and saw a man standing in front of him, with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or, or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I think it's interesting that Joshua, seeing a man with a drawn sword, still went up to him. I don't know if I would have gone up to him. But there must have been something about this man standing in front of him with a drawn sword that drew Joshua to him even though there was a drawn sword. So a couple things to note here in this story. Uh, first, the man, quote unquote, the man was standing in front of him with a drawn sword. Why that's interesting is if you think about it, if you can picture it, a drawn sword means what? It's a posture of battle. It's an aggressive posture. It was a posture that said, you need to be careful. And he's in Joshua's way. He's in front of Joshua. And with a drawn sword, you got a decision to make. Do you run away? Do you try to run around? Or do you talk to him? Do you want to talk things out? It's important when people have drawn swords in our life, i.e. they're angry, they're upset, that, that we want to talk to them, that we want to try and work things out. And Joshua had a, a desire to work things out, even with a man with a drawn sword. And then two, Joshua said, are you on our side or our enemies? And the man in front of him said, neither. And the point here is that Jesus is not, we're not on, or Jesus is not on our side. We need to be on his side. And this man, and I say, quote unquote, man that was standing in front of Joshua, revealed himself to Joshua as the captain of the host. This was the Lord Jesus himself, that, that was standing aggressively in front of Joshua. And he's not saying to Joshua, hey, listen, I'm going to be on your side and I'm going to go with you. No, 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 no. Joshua, you're going to be on my side. You're going to go with me. And it's always important to know when we're going into battle and we battle every day that Jesus isn't necessarily on our side. We're on his side. We want to fight where he's fighting and we want to go where he's going. Now, as hard as it is for some people to understand, especially in this day and age, God takes an aggressive stance towards those who reject Him. It's clear that you're either with God or you're not with God. It's that, it's that simple. And it's not, it's not for punishment's sake that God takes this aggressive stance towards those who reject Him. It's not, it's not for punishment or judgment, but God wants to get us on the right side. His. His is the right side. And so God aggressively pursues people that do not know Him because He wants them to come to Him. 
Romans 1.18 says this, The wrath of God is on those who suppress the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. I closed last week's message with John 14.6, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. And people are suppressing the truth. They are rejecting God by suppressing the truth. As a result, there is this aggressive stance or posture towards those people. Because God wants them to change. God wants them to see the error of their ways and return to Him. See, what God really wants is not judgment, but mercy. He wants to show us His mercy. But our sin puts us on the wrong side of God. Our rejection of the truth, Jesus, puts us on the wrong side. But it's up to us. If we want peace, and today we're talking about peace from Galatians chapter 5, that the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And the really the only one who brings us peace is Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit then reveals that peace to us. But it's on, it's on us to accept and agree with God's terms for a peace treaty. Otherwise, our lives are in pieces. We come to God for peace, or our lives are broken and fragmented in pieces. Here's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Wicked there would be defined as anyone who is not covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus, because of what He did on the cross, which we celebrated last week with Good Friday and then Easter, what Jesus did on the cross brought us peace and then brought us His righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, 1 Corinthians 5, 21. God made Jesus... Come for us, ask Jesus to come for us, and what he did on the cross then made us righteous before God. So we're not wicked anymore. Now, there's times that I do unrighteous things, but I'm not an unrighteous man. I'm righteous because of Jesus. But there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Sadly, in our generation, the fragmentation of the human soul goes undetected. So many people in this world their lives are broken, their, their soul is fragmented, they're living in pieces, and they don't even realize it. The erosion of the soul caused by sin chips away at us, and then we wonder why. Why is our health? Why do we have health problems? Why is our marriage or our families or our jobs falling apart? Why can't we get any traction? Why can't we get ahead in life? Uh, how come, how come this, is, this is not working and that's not working? And, and we're struggling in so many areas of our lives and we, we sometimes fail to connect the dots that we're not living in peace with God, that we're living in sin and that sin is fragmenting our soul. So we scratch our head and wonder, what's wrong? What's wrong with life? What's wrong with, with this or that? And all the while, all the while, we wonder why things aren't working, why things aren't as good as they could be. The Holy Spirit is continuing to draw us to return to the Lord for His forgiveness. In Psalms chapter 32, David talked about a time when his soul was heavy and his strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And how he just felt isolated and broken and, and nothing seemed to be working. It was just a big struggle that Joshua, or I mean that David was, was encountering. And then he acknowledged his sin to the Lord. That's what he said. Then I acknowledged my sin to the Lord and I asked for his forgiveness. See, many, many theologians believe that, that that period of time that David was in reference to in Psalms chapter 32 was after he'd committed sin with Bathsheba. And there was about a year's time that God gave David the opportunity to repent, and David didn't, until finally he sent Nathan the prophet to say to him, you've sinned. And David immediately repented. Then he wrote that beautiful psalm in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. 
But there was that period of time that many believe that David was walking in sin and it caused an erosion or a fragmentation of his life. He was living in pieces, not in peace. The effects of living in sin, here are some. Emotional volatility and confusion. When there's, when there's things that aren't working and there's confusion out there, you're emotionally volatile. The anger easily, uh, frustration, um, agitation. You know, you just, you, there's just a volatility to your emotions. You lack confidence in chaos. So when bad things happen because you're living in pieces, not in peace, bad things happen. You wonder, oh, I'm being judged or God's against me. It also, it also produces cowardice. Cowardice is not, is not shrinking in fear. Really, a, a better definition of cowardice, especially from the Old Testament, is the lack of courage. The lack of courage is being double-minded, not being single-minded. So you're vacillating, you're wavering, you're wondering what to do, and, and that's causing this stop and start and stop and start and stall. But when you're confident and you, and you, have, you have courage, you make a decision because you believe God's speaking to you and you move forward. And then it also, uh, the, the living in sin, what it does also is it, is it just harasses you with guilt. You're, you're always questioning yourself rather than just going to God and, and making, a peace, making peace with Him. People in our lives are living broken lives, in pieces, fragmented. And God wants to make us whole. That's what He wants to do. He wants to make you whole. And, and really, you'll never have wholeness in your life on earth until you're whole with God in heaven. We have to have a vertical peace with God before we have a horizontal peace with man and ourselves. And the beauty of God's wholeness is we have no more holes in our life. Yes, things still, uh, you know, fall apart or there's still things that, that don't work right. But inwardly, there's no holes because God has made us whole. So we can live in pieces and not go to God, or we can live in peace. We can live in peace. Here's what Romans 5, 1 says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's that simple. Confess your sins, and you have peace with God. Get right with God. Get on the right side with God, and you'll have peace. Not perfection. Life will never be perfect. If life were perfect on earth, you'd never want to go to heaven. But you can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is twofold. One is the absence of conflict. It means unity. You're together, union. My wife and I, by and large, live a life absent of conflict. We disagree on things, but we work it out. And I say this all the time, if you wanna work it out, you gotta talk it out. So my wife and I will immediately, when there's conflict, we will talk it out. Because we wanna be unified, we wanna have unity. So peace is the absence of conflict, and then it's also the presence of calm or rest. In one of the translations from, from uh, Isaiah 48, 22, it says there's no rest for the wicked. There's no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. There's also no rest. Because if you don't have peace, there's no rest. If there's war, then you're, you're on alert all the time. Well, the absence of conflict, the presence of calm. Don't you want that? I'll tell you, I want that in my life. There's not a relationship that I have that I want conflict in. I want calm. I want peace. I want rest. And I'll tell you, the absence of conflict and the presence of calm is necessary for us to have happy, productive lives. That's what we need. One of the things about sheep that um, Philip Kelleher wrote in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalms 23, he said that sheep do not feed well when there's, when there's chaos, when there's conflict, when there's threats of enemies. They don't feed well. And that's why the shepherd moves about the sheep, because it calms the sheep down. And when they're calm, 
they're eating. If you ever drive by a pasture and there's sheep that are feeding, you can know this, they feel safe. They feel safe. They're not agitated. They're not stirred up. They're not, they're not uh, in conflict. Jesus provided both of these, the absence of conflict with God and the presence of calm in his presence with his death, burial, and resurrection, which we celebrated last week. So here's the thing. If you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, if you've invited Christ into your heart, the discord with God is over. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, it's done. It's done. God's aggressive stance or posture toward you is removed. The sword isn't drawn. The sword's in the scabbard. The sword's still there because he's God. But the sword is not drawn in front of you any longer. Jesus' life, and I want you to know that while Jesus walked on earth, it was one of complete peace with God. There was never a moment that God and Jesus were at odds with each other, except when Jesus is on the cross and he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That, that many believe and I believe that at that moment, all the sins of mankind were poured on Jesus and God had to turn away and break faith with Jesus. And their unity was broken. Other than that, Jesus walked in complete peace and harmony with God. And he did that so that we could walk in agreement with God, which is Amos 3.3. It says this, Amos 3.3, do two walk together unless they've agreed to do so. In other words, there has to be an agreement, a holding of hands, so to speak, for two to walk together on the same, in, on the same path in the same direction. I want to walk in the same, uh, on the same path and in the same direction as God. But I want to walk with him. He doesn't walk with me. He's not on our side. I'm on his side. And this peace of mind, what it does... When you think about what Jesus did for you, the peace of mind that you have, what it does is it, is it puts an end to the interpersonal demons that we all struggle with. And I, I don't want you struggling with interpersonal demons anymore. I want you to be free in, in your relationship with God because of what Jesus did. Not because of what you do or don't do. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. And as a result, of what Jesus did for us. We never need to fear God, be afraid of Him, or shrink back from Him ever again. Ever again. You can boldly go to the throne with confidence. You can approach God. Hebrews 4.15. Not because you've been a good little boy or a good little girl, but because God is good. And Jesus has made us good. Because of Jesus, God has no problem with you, no issue with you, no conflict with you. God's at peace with you because of Jesus. He's put the sword away. And all he wants is for you to come to him as his father, as your father. As Paul said in Romans 8, we can call him daddy. You can come to your daddy and, and just be honest with him about your life. Be honest with him about your, your, your issues and your struggles, your fears and your, your sin. And let him wash over you with forgiveness and love and mercy. His goodness made us good. The goodness of Jesus made us good with God. And I, and, and I pray in confidence now because of who Jesus is in my life. There's one, one final scripture I want you to see. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Here's what Paul said. But now, I love that. What a great start. But now... Right now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Now, the result, I have peace with God. It's much easier for me to live in peace with myself and with others. That's when the fruit of the Spirit begins to be evident to all. There's something about you that's, that's peace and it's a draw. It's a drawing factor for people in conflict and struggle. They want to know what you have because people want peace. Will you bow your heads? If you, if you're living in sin, if you're, if you're not confessing your sins, don't let your strength be sapped as in the heat of summer 
Acknowledge your sin to God. It's from Romans 30, uh, Psalms uh, 32, which I referenced earlier. First John 1 John 1.9 says, But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, purify us of all unrighteousness. Be honest with God. It's okay. He can take it. Our God's pretty tough. Our God is, is, is not just tough, but is incredibly loving. As powerful as God is, He is that loving. As strong as His judgment is, His mercy is greater. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And God wants to be merciful to you. So like Joshua, approach Him. Approach God. Give your life to Him. Confess Him as your Savior. And walk in His peace. Father, thank You for bringing us our peace. You Yourself are our peace with God. Jesus, we love You and thank You. In Your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, and God bless you. Walk in peace. Hi, everyone. This is Pastor David. If you responded to Pastor's prayer at the end, really his challenge and encouragement, and you're thinking, I really want Jesus in my life. I don't want that feeling of, of my strength sapped like in the heat of summer, and I want God's forgiveness. First of all, if you prayed that, you've received that forgiveness. God is faithful to his promise, and his grace is stronger than your shame, stronger than your sin. But you might be thinking, okay, what next? What do I do next? So we want to give you a chance to reach out to us. Let us know if you have any questions, if you want to talk to someone, uh, if you're looking for a church, whether you're local or whether you're somewhere else, we just, we'd love to connect with you. So you can contact us uh, through our phone, you can contact us through email or even through our website, but we'd love to talk with you, pray with you, and, but congratulations on, on responding to the Lord's prompt in your heart, and we'll talk to you soon.